Hey everybody, and welcome to my talk, Who Goes There? Actively Detecting Intruders with Cyber Deception Tools here at HashiTalks Deploy 2023. Very happy to be here with you. So I'm Dwayne, I live in Chicago. I've been a developer advocate since 2016, and I'm also the co-host of the Security Repo Podcast. Free podcast out there to talk about all sorts of awesome security topics. Uh, hit me up on the internet at MC Dwayne most places, or uh, LinkedIn at Dwayne McDaniel. Uh, Feel free to email me as well, dwayne.mcdaniel at getguardian.com. GetGuardian is where I work. Uh, we'll come up with a couple points in today's talk, but that's not the main focus. Uh, we're here to help enterprises with their code security issues, primarily around hard-coded credentials and if they've leaked or have been breached. I'm happy to talk to you about that in depth. Feel free to email me about that or hit me up online. But that's not why we're here. We're here today to talk about cyber deception. But before we go any further, let me deploy something real quick. So I have the set of AWS keys and secrets. I'm gonna go over here and make it look like I have made those a comment. And I'm gonna go ahead and save those directly. And I've deployed that now. This is out live on the internet. We'll come back to that later. Just put a bookmark in that. That's kind of a dumb thing to do though, because well, we know attackers want your credentials. I'm gonna tell a couple very quick horror stories of what could go wrong if someone gets your credentials or your credentials get leaked. And they're gonna be scary. So I don't mean to terrify anybody. If you do feel, hey, I feel a panic attack coming on from these horror stories, just go ahead and recite the Bene Gesserit Litany Against Fear and you will be fine. You will live through it. Only you will remain, the fear will be gone. I promise. Uber, we probably all remember the story from last year where a single attacker goes and fishes a super admin for their credentials. And yes, they have multi-factor authentication on before you think, well, MFA would have solved it. They had MFA on. The attacker flooded the uh, requests for MFA and eventually a thumb slipped or they got tired. We don't know the full story. Anyway, attacker gets in finds a bunch of PowerShell scripts chock full of hard-coded credentials, ends up poning everything, including their PAM. So they got into Hacker One and told them, hey, I'm hacking this, and they didn't believe them, flooded their Slack. Again, the company's like, this has got to be a joke. Next person you talk to is the New York Times, and that's why we know this story. Maybe this affected you back in January, 2023, an attacker got in through a remote developer's environment and was able to steal a bunch of credentials from inside of Circle CI's infrastructure. They used those credentials to get into the customer accounts and started stealing customer credentials. And Circle CI acted very quickly in here and responsibly, and the best course of action they had was to rotate everyone's credentials, and that broke thousands of pipelines. Interesting note on this one when uh, this happened, a uh, independent security researchers on the internet said, hey, all of my honey tokens went off. Something's gone wrong inside of Circle CI. So that's some advanced warning. So that's a little foreshadowing of what we'll talk about in a second. And here's another story that really bothers me personally uh, for a number of reasons, but it's kind of that perfect storm where a developer pushes and test environment credentials out to public GitHub and no big deal, right? They shared a test environment credential. What could go wrong? Maybe somebody spin up some uh, crypto mining or something. No, what actually happened was a second developer pushed real patient data into that test environment. And it took them about a year to figure that out. We don't know how many patients were affected. We really don't know the full scope of this. All we got was an apology from AstraZeneca. That's some of the ways that this can go wrong, but it all points back to the fact that attackers are gonna exploit any chance they have to uh, or exploit any credentials they can find to get further into a system. We know how they behave. We've seen it time and time again. Uh, this is the MITRE attack framework. Um, you, you land, you map the land, you laterally expand, you escalate privilege, you exfiltrate, you get out. Um, we went on a few steps there, but that's the thing. Point is we know how they behave. And if we're over there on the right, defending our stuff, if we're just putting all of our effort in defending, like making sure they don't get in, 
what do we do when they do get in? Well, what we need to do is react so fast to put them on their heels and they don't know what to do next. And that's really the theme of the rest of this talk. We do know how they behave. Again, they can follow that attack framework and we know what they're after. We know they're after data for reasons that start with an R and end with an and somewhere. And they were for machine resources because they can spend up crypto mining. They can sell those machine resources on the dark web. There's a lot of things they can do with it. And any, basically anything that leads them back to one or two on this list. We know how they behave. We also know that there's this problem of leaked credentials, those hard-coded credentials out there in the world. That last year we found over 10 million hard-coded credentials just hanging out on GitHub Public. Uh, you can go read the full uh, report over on State of Secret Sprawl report from Git Guardian to get all the details of what was what we discovered out there on public GitHub. But this is just a tip of the iceberg situation. There's so many other systems out there where we weren't looking. Uh, places like Replit or just S3 buckets where people have thrown code. But we know this trend continues to get worse, not better, that people keep sharing credentials and hard coding them, making that lateral expansion so much easier. But since we know they always laterally expand, and we know that this is a problem, and they know it's a problem, we can use it against them. And that's the whole rest of this talk. We've been doing this throughout history. We're really good at this. We've been doing this for thousands of years, in fact. Uh, this arbitrarily, or this might be arguably not part of cyber defense, but it's still an important part of cyber um, security today. Trojan viruses are still a thing. It looks like something, but something else inside. Looking strong where you're weak and weak where you're strong. Sun Tzu, well, gets credit with that for uh, writing The Art of War. But we've seen this trope in a lot of places, and it, it's pretty good tactic. Lead your opponent over here when we're really, uh, that's what we want them to do, because that's where we're strongest. And we saw a good example of that more in the modern world back in World War II. Uh, this is a story, if you're not familiar with it, there's a great documentary called the Ghost Army, you can go view out there in, on the internet. Um, basically, we didn't have enough tanks and planes and guns and everything to go hold Northern Africa in uh, the early days of US involvement in World War II. So we went to Hollywood and said, hey, what can we do? They built us these inflatable tanks and planes. And we were able to stage those very quickly and quietly and then distract the Axis powers to say, go look over here. Meanwhile, we snuck all the real tanks and planes and guns over and from another direction. And well, that's how we won World War II. Again, you can go find a much more about that. But again, let's make them think we're doing this when really we're doing that. Get to the modern era uh, where the term honeypot comes from. And Cliff Stoll over here, he wrote this great book called The Cuckoo's Egg that documents this entire story in awesome detail. But they also made a really fun to watch Nova documentary about this in 1990 called the KGB, the computer in me. Highly recommend watching this after Hashi, uh, after Hashi talks are done uh, in your own free time. But basically uh, he was working at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, discovered that someone was getting in and stealing computer time. And not just with them, he started tracing it back and realizing, hey, this person went through all these other non-secured, non-classified servers that are owned by the government, owned by the military, something's going on. So in order to track this person back to where they were originating the call and they went through a lot of hops, uh, his girlfriend suggested they add a lot of fake information, uh, movie scripts, conspiracy theories, anything to get their hands on. Let's add all of this to the server. 1985 download speeds are really slow. So after a long time of trying to pull all this down, they finally were able to trace back and find this particular hacker. Uh, won't spoil the ending for you, but it's a really, really interesting story. I highly recommend you check out. But this idea of Honeypot was born from that. That's a sticky thing that it's going to take them a while to deal with and gives us an alert to know exactly what we're dealing with. This idea gets translated by Fred Cohen into the Deception Toolkit. Basically, if the system's not in use for a legitimate thing, that should tell us that anyone touching it is using it for an illegitimate reason. 
I'm oversimplifying it, but it's more of a set of protocol and set of uh, standards than it is like actual technology implementation. But I highly recommend you go read it and dig into it for yourself. Uh, but it gave us what we think of today as the modern honeypot because it led directly to this a few years later. Uh, Alfred Uger said, hey, this is a real problem. We need to address attackers getting into your system now. Uh, I love this quote from him. Uh, hackers aren't kids on a digital joyride to clear their motives financial gain. The term hacking comes from MIT and it was engineering students playing pranks. That's what a hack was. Let's build a car on top of the dome. Let's attach a fire hydrant to a drinking fountain. Those were hacks. And about this time, around the turn of the millennia, uh, Alfred's like, no, this, these are gangs out to steal your stuff, to steal your resources, to do harm. Hey, here's a product ready to go. You don't have to go invent this. This is CyberCop Sting. Just deploy it, and you are ready to catch those perpetrators. Fast forward in time a little bit, uh, and there's a conversation. There's a lot of conversations around honeypots, CyberCop Sting, and, and other systems like that out in the world. And Augusto says an interesting thing here in a very short message. Uh, he's been playing around with this idea of instead of honeypots or hosts or nets, uh, deploying something called a honey token. It's just a piece of information that shouldn't flow over the network. And if it does, something's wrong. Thanks very much, Augusto, because this launches a whole new realm of cyber defense, uh, cyber deception and cyber security. Uh, honey tokens, or I'm sorry, canary tokens are born a few years later. Uh, I'm leaving out a few things from the history here. These are the major high points in my opinion, but a company out of South Africa called Thinkst uh, they're still around. We'll talk about them later a little bit. They build this thing called Canary Tokens, and you can go download the code for yourself. And in 2016, they introduce a fake AWS token into it. This is where I think we really reach the modern era of a honey token. That's not just this ethereal idea of information or a bit of data that shouldn't flow. It is token in the modern sense of I'm trying to do a thing. Here's the token to let me do it. Fast forward a little bit more and we get to this year. And I was very fortunate enough to be at RSA in 2023 and see this talk by Kevin Mandia. And he says, basically the talk is, we can defend with hardening our walls and our defenses all we want. We're still probably gonna get breached at some level at some point. There are apex attackers out there. You can go watch this talk yourself. Um, it's on YouTube. Um, basically toward the end, he starts saying things like, we just need to make sure we're aware when they get in. We need early warning signs. And there at the bottom of the screen, you see honey tokens, account bait, as he calls it, are those early warning signs. I was very fortunate again to be able to take this picture uh, back at RSA. But that gets us to the modern era. And that's what we're gonna talk about the rest of this is like, what is a modern honey token? How do you build one? And what are the best practices around it? And about the next 15 minutes we got left. So just a level set, because I did throw out a couple different variations of the term honey token, including Augusto's original um, uh, exact words. In the modern world in 2023, moving forward, honey token really is a decoy credential. That's how kind of the whole industry looks at this problem set. It looks like a real credential. It looks like a real thing, but when you go to use it, it doesn't work. It doesn't go to anything. Instead, it triggers an alert on well, your side of the world uh, to let you know that someone's tried to use it. Very importantly, though, they look identical to real credentials because they are real credentials. This is one way to build a honey token. Let's dive straight into the architecture. I love architecture diagrams. Um, this comes from uh, GG Canary, which is our uh, open source honey token building uh, code. You can go download it yourself. This uh, particular diagram isn't in that repo. It's in a blog post you can find by looking on our blog, GG Canary, uh, here at Git Guardian. But basically, it's two Terraform scripts. The first Terraform script says, build me a bunch of users. They don't give them any access, any privilege whatsoever. These are zero access privileged users. And let's store those users in a list. Now let's set up a Lambda function with another Terraform script 
that Terraform script is going to take that list that we made, store it in an S3 bucket, and then watch for people trying to use anything with or related to our account, which we can easily do with Cloud Trails. Uh, if the Lambda function matches something on the list with something in the bucket, go ahead and send an alert out over Slack or SES or, or SendGrid to let us know that something has happened out in the world. This is one way to build them. This is one way to think about them, but basically we have real credentials that don't go to anything, a way to check and see if they're being used, and an alert system. That's basically the fundamental pieces you need. Like anything else in technology, there's a good argument for building it yourself because you can understand it. There's no black box element versus buying off the shelf, which brings scale and automation with it. And I'm gonna talk about both, but I would encourage you to go the DIY route if you are a technology person who wants to understand how the sausage gets made. You can tinker around with this. There's a lot of ways to experiment. Just go back to Augusto's original message in that thread, a piece of information that shouldn't move. So if you're working in a Windows system, I think there's a tool out there to watch. I think it's called File Watcher or something like that, um, where you can watch and see if a file moves around. So you can play around with this idea all day. But when you start getting serious about it at scale, especially around code security, that's where I would say go look at the examples from open source. GG Canary is a great one. And I already talked about how that works. Space Siren, special shout out to them. Space Siren is a project that picked up the work of Space Crab, which was an earlier implementation of, of a honey token. Um, it does require some AWS knowledge, but it's pretty straightforward in how to build these things and how they work. Not that much different than what we did with GG Canary. And then if you want to see how Canary tokens are built by Thinkst, they open source their tooling. So if you're building this, remember that it's going to be up to you to maintain and deal with all of the ramifications of these things. So if you need an enterprise solution, congratulations, they exist. You don't have to go build this yourself. Uh, I would start with that one on the top if you're just experimenting and you've never heard of a honey token before, canarytokens.org, they're free one-off honey tokens. Um, I'm not gonna go to the site for right now for sake of time, but you can go set up uh, a fake email accounts, fake um, SQL files, fake Excel spreadsheets, uh, most importantly, fake tokens, um, even fake credit cards these days. But for one-offs, set them, forget them. It's not a bad system, but again, it's scale wise, it's it's very limited. Uh, they do sell that at scale, that same tool, it's called canary.tools. Not gonna get into the commercials of that, um, let you explore that again for sake of time. Here at Git Guardian, we make one. It's in addition to our platform, so it's not a standalone product. Uh, since we're looking out for hard coded credentials, we think it makes sense to know when they got leaked or when you've been breached uh, and to know what else is in that account. So we cross reference all that data for you. Um, if you're a customer, definitely talk to us about that. And then uh, if you're looking into Git Guardian, well, that's another reason to look into us. Uh, Microsoft Sentinel has this built in. It's Azure specific, and I do not understand the inner workings of it because I just haven't spent the cycles to, to look. Um, but if, you want, if you're using this in production, let me know. I would love to have that conversation with you on how your mileage is gone. I know CrowdStrike sells this as well as part of their offering. I don't, I'm not a CrowdStrike customer, so I can't tell you exactly the ins and outs of it. Uh, but I have had a conversation with the Proofpoint team that builds Identity Threat Defense Shadow, which is what they call theirs. Um, it's a really interesting honey pot solution that has a honey token element to it. Uh, I'm not gonna say more than that because I would do it a disservice, but these are just some of the options out there. My point is, if you wanna do honey tokens at scale, there are a lot of ways to do it that you don't need to build yourself. No matter how you arrive at the actual honey token in hand that you deploy, there's some best practice for you. So first, put them in private environments. Anywhere where someone has to log in, if it's behind a thing, uh, behind some kind of authorization, that's a probably good place for it. Uh, not just your code, not your private code bases, that's a great place for them, but also in your CI environments. Anywhere that's got a text field that I would need to be logged in to be able to see this. Since there's no legitimate use for them, there's not a real danger of a developer just picking them up and saying, I wonder what this goes to. Let me see if it's valid. I highly doubt that's gonna happen. Uh, same thing with uh, Jira or Slack. 
we highly recommend putting them in vaults as well, your vault systems, because if someone's breached that, well, they have your keys to pretty much everything, and you want to know immediately that something has gone wrong. Do use a one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, put one honey token in one place, and then make a new honey token to go into the next place. You don't want to have the scenario where you've deployed the same honey token to 100 things, because the honey token goes off, gives you an alert that someone has tried to use that honey token, and now you have to do some investigation work, put on your Sherlock Holmes hat and figure out which of these repos or which of these environments was in fact exposed. You wanna know immediately, this honey token went off, that goes to this base only, no other honey tokens went off, great. Now I know that I've gotta deal with this one repo or this one environment. Uh, do you think in terms of automation, yeah, you can do these onesie twosies one off by hand, but once you start thinking in terms of all of your repos and all of your developers and all your lines of code, then it's pretty obvious to think, well, I need an API I can hit and just deploy these. Uh, some commercial systems offer one, some don't. Uh, your mileage may vary on this. Uh, GitGuardian built one. I built a, a sample automation script. Won't make a lot of sense because I didn't write a lot of documentation for it, but just gets the idea of check and see if there's a honey token. If there's not, build one and let's go deploy it. And unless you specifically are a law enforcement agent, think about this in terms of blue team. You're using this as a defensive tool to cut dwell times. Like I don't recognize this IP address. This IP address should definitely not be touching our code. Let's get rid of, let's deal with that situation. Let's defend, let's uh, disallow list. That's whatever we need to do, adjust WAF rules. However you do it, but just think in terms of what else has been exposed and how am I defending what I own? You can easily fall down this slippery slope of going after someone and crossing some international lines without meaning to. So think in terms of defense, not offense with this. And like everything else in tech, this is going to be a journey. It's not a one-off exercise. Start with one repo start with one place like Jira and move out from there. Um, once you understand you're really comfortable with it, that's when automation is going to kick in for you. And you're going to see, obviously, we should be doing this every time. And once you start thinking that, well, that's where automation comes from. And let's go check on that honey token I pushed out in public earlier. So again, I'm using the Git Guardian dashboard for this. Uh, and I see that that's what I deployed. Uh, 21 minutes ago was how long I deployed it. Or actually, that's when the first alert came in. Uh, so, wow, yeah. Uh, it's been 11 times it's been hit out in public. Um, I see the first one was from AWS. That makes perfect sense. I'll get to why in a minute. And then I see, hey, there's some people I don't recognize from India. And, uh, I don't know this. Don't know what that address is. I know what these are. I think these are Git Guardian specifically scanning it. Because honey tokens aren't meant to be deployed publicly. What I did basically is something you probably shouldn't do. If you put a honey token in a public place, a scanner is going to hit it. There are all sorts of scanners out there. As showed, AWS hit it first. They're very serious about scanning for their own tokens on the internet. Um, a lot of systems have them. Git Guardian, of course, we build one that's constantly scanning uh, GitHub public, and that's where I deployed that one. Um, but they're going to get triggered. In fact, the same thing that triggers those public with those public scans isn't they just reading it. Someone just reading it isn't going to do anything. It's then they tried to use it. And not that they maliciously tried to go do something bad with it, but they just tried to validate that it, in fact, exists and that it goes to something. There's a lot of validation step built into a number of tools, including Git Guardian, including Shufflehog, which you saw over there, that just quickly check to see, hey, does this work? And especially with main systems like big systems like AWS. Um, so those automatically trigger it and say, yes, in fact, this doesn't work, but the act of trying is what actually sets it off. So in conclusion, if we just play defense, it's really hard to win this game of security. Keeping them out should be our goal, but also 
kicking them out once they get in should also be part of that goal. They're going to get in. We just have to live with that reality. Every second you can push them back on their heels and make them think, the attacker think, I don't know what to do next. This isn't in the playbook. I got bounced from the server after being in there for three minutes. I don't know what to do about this. Oh, and by the way, I did not show this. Uh, I probably should have. Um, I have an alert here on my phone uh, from 20 some minutes ago. Uh, my honey token was triggered. So I got this alert on my phone pretty much right after I started talking, right after I deployed that honey token. It showed me immediately, I got an alert. I just didn't show it on screen because, well, I didn't. Um, maybe I should have. But we need to push them on their heels as fast as possible. Honey tokens are a very clean way to do that. They're a very efficient way to get that alert quickly to, so you can act on it immediately and cut those dwell times down to minutes and not hours or days. You're not on your own. You can go build these yourself, but there's a lot of commercial options like I already showed. Uh, and again, you're on defense probably if you're watching this. So make sure that you're aware that someone's in there poking around or that your code got leaked. Um, if a public scanner hits it, that means it got leaked. If it not public scanner hits it, then it's probably an individual trying to breach you or they've already breached you. So think in terms of how do you defend in those situations. But I'm out of time. I'm Dwayne. I live in Chicago. Hit me up on the internet to talk about this or pretty much anything else. Uh, I'm also the host of the, the Security Repo Podcast. Definitely go check that out. And again, thanks for being on my talk here at Hashi Talks Deploy. Um, if you have any questions at all, hit me up on the internet at dwayne.mcdaniel at getguardian.com. Thank you very much.